Hi, we've been talking about the special moral problems faced by multinational corporations. International business poses some serious problems, problems that often do not face merely domestic companies. There are so many different political systems, economic systems, legal systems, and cultural systems consisting of various practices of values that have to be navigated by a, a multinational corporation to do what it does. How does it do that? How can we find our way through that complex maze? We've already looked at one set of moral norms trying to answer that question, those proposed by Robert de George. Today I want to look at a different set, Thomas Donaldson's set of norms, which are much simpler, much more direct, and which in a sense give us a helpful guide to trying to understand this. But it raises some deep ethical questions too, questions that I think might have answers, but nevertheless are things that we have to investigate. Here are Donaldson's principles. They're very direct. They're really only three. First of all, we respect core, absolute human values. Donaldson starts from the premise that there are core, absolute human values, things that transcend cultural differences, social expectations, political systems, legal systems, economic systems, and so on. There are basic human rights, for example. There are basic moral norms that apply across the board, absolutely, that are not relative to any culture, any society, any legal framework, or anything like that. So for example, the value of human life. We'll come back to this question of what these core values are, but they are things that have to be respected. So the first question is, respect those universal ethical norms. Respect these things that are really absolute ethical values. The second is, adapt yourself to local customs and to local norms and practices. Now it's obvious that one and two can come into conflict. There may be local practices that you find ethically objectionable. Well, there's a reason they're in that order. The first thing is respect those absolute rights, those absolute moral norms. Secondly, to the extent possible, given those moral norms, adapt yourself to local customs and practices. Respect the customs and practices of that host country to the extent that those absolute moral principles permit you to do that. And finally, take context into account. The context is important here, and I think it's worthwhile pointing that out. We've talked some about the relativity of certain conceptions of virtues, but also of moral norms, of expectations, of rights, of obligations, of what is permissible, what privileges one has, depending on the nature of the relationship. For example, in an authority ranking relationship, there's one set of ethical norms. In an equality matching relationship, a different one, a communal sharing relationship, yet another one. And then in addition to all of that, we have simply the market pricing sort of model that applies between any two strangers. It's their expectations and norms that go along with that as well. So we need to think about not only those kinds of contexts, but also more specific contexts. What kind of relationship are we talking about here? Is it an employment relationship? Is it a personal friendship type of relationship? Is it something that involves things that we consider universal human rights? What exactly is the context in which we're expected to adapt ourselves to these local customs and practices, the local traditions that people there take as constitutive of their culture? Sometimes the idea is we should adapt. In other contexts, we might not be willing to adapt. Why is that true? Well, I think we can understand it more clearly by thinking about the distinction between core values and peripheral values. Donaldson's idea is that we respect core values first, core values that really are universal and absolute. And then with respect to things that are more peripheral, we adapt ourselves to local customs and practices. That puts a heavy weight on that distinction between core norms and peripheral norms. So how do we make that distinction? I don't think it's an easy question to answer. If we start out as Kantians, we're going to have one conception of what core values are. If we're consequentialists, we might have a different conception. Virtue ethicists, yet a third conception, and so on. But here's one way we could think about it that tries to be ethically universal and abstract away from cultural, social, legal, political differences. John Locke thinks about a situation like the state of nature, a situation in which there simply is no government authority. There is no legal structure. Nobody has any political authority 
over anyone else. What would that be like? We've seen Hobbes's answer. It would be a war of all against all. Life there would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Locke's response is, no, it wouldn't. Are you going to just let people kill you? Are you going to let people steal your stuff? No, you're going to find ways of protecting yourself. You will form neighborhood watches. You will have posses. You will have vigilante groups that help police things. You will yourself take revenge and try to make sure that people don't mess with you. In short, he says, we're going to have a situation much like the Old West. When it was being settled, before there was any legal structure in a territory, was it a war of all against all? No, actually, the level of violence in the Wild West, well, the Wild West, it wasn't that wild. Outside of young men getting into barroom fights, there actually wasn't that much violence. And it wasn't because there was a legal structure. It wasn't because you could call the police. It was because people would defend themselves. And defend themselves individually, but also defend themselves in groups. A community would have a group of people empowered to defend it. And that kept the peace moderately well. It created other dangers, of course. It created dangers of posses, vigilante groups, and so on, getting out of hand and pursuing things unjustly. After all, the judge, jury, and execution were in effect all become the same as people who are intimately connected to the victim of the crime, in this case. You can't trust justice to emerge from that, Locke says. But before we think about that, think back to that initial state of nature. He says there are rights that we have in the state of nature. There is a law of nature that governs the state of nature. It is that no one shall harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. In other words, in the state of nature itself, independently of government authority, everyone has a right to life, a right to liberty, a right to property. Murder is wrong even in the state of nature. Theft is wrong even in the state of nature. Slavery is wrong even in the state of nature. And so all of those things are things that have to be respected independently of government, independently of any legal authority, independently, therefore, of any particular social structure or cultural practice. So here's one way of thinking about what core values are, what core absolute human rights are. We could follow Locke and we could think it's a question of life, liberty, and property. It's a question of respecting human life, of respecting people's liberty, of respecting property. If we think that, then we're going to have a conception of core values. Now, of course, it's not the only conception of that core. We could be Kantians who say, no, it is a right to respect, a right to equal treatment and being respected as an end in myself. That's the fundamental core value. Or you might think, with a consequentialist, no, it is utility. It is the greatest happiness of the greatest number. It is basically trying to produce something that improves the welfare of the entire community. Well, however you construe that, the idea is going to be there are certain core values. Let's, for the moment, take a Lockean approach and just suppose those are fundamental human rights to life, liberty, and property. Those you don't adapt even if the cultural practice in that country does involve murder, slavery, theft, you're not to engage in that. And if that's the cost of doing business in that country, you shouldn't pay it. You shouldn't do business there. But other things are more peripheral. Other things you should adapt to the local customs. Now, what are some things like that? Well, of course, most things we'd think are like that. Most things are not such as to violate rights to life, liberty, and property. What then are peripheral values? The things that Donaldson says you should negotiate, in effect, and adapt to the local practice. Here are some examples. Conceptions of positive entitlements. Some countries, for example, think that people have basic rights to health care, or to employment, or to housing, or to a variety of other positive things that the government has to provide for them. Other societies don't. That's one of those peripheral values that seems to vary country to country. Now, of course, on some conceptions, those are fundamental human rights, and on other conceptions, they're not. But one way of looking at this is to say that precisely tells us that they aren't really part of this universal core. They are things on which people differ, on which cultures differ, societies differ, political and economic systems differ. So, must a multinational corporation respect them? It should adapt to the local practice. If the local practice there requires government-paid health care, for example, or requires companies to provide health care, it should do it. Second thing, work-life balance. 
How do you expect employees to balance their private lives and their work for the company? Different societies have very different expectations about that. Should you impose an American model, for example, if you're a company based in the United States, no matter where you are? Donaldson would say, no, that's something where you adapt to the local customs, at least in most respects. Now here, I think we have to be careful. This is contextual. He says, look, I'm not saying always adapt to the local customs here. Think about the context. For example, suppose it really is the custom in that country that nobody shows up for work. You might say, well, this is unacceptable. You have to actually show up. And so it's not as if he's saying, yeah, you should open up a plant there and then just take for granted that, yeah, nobody's going to show up to work, but we have to pay them anyway. No, there you might say, this is a context where, I'm sorry, our values have to take precedence over your values. We can't accomplish the corporate mission. If you do that, we wouldn't locate here at all. Unless you adapted to us in this respect, we didn't adapt to you. There may be situations like that. So in short, he's saying, look, it is highly context dependent how we negotiate the balance in these cases of peripheral values. In peripheral matters, typically the prima facie rule is adapt yourself to the local customs, but not always. It depends on the context. And one way in which it depends on the context is, is this a context that really affects the central aspects of our corporate mission? Can we do what we do here if we adapt? And sometimes the answer is going to be no. Or sometimes it might be that a compromise there is so radically disadvantageous to us that we can't afford to do it. So in short, we have to judge these things case by case, context by context. The presumption should be we adapt ourselves to the customs, unless there's some universal rule, universal norm that tells us not to, unless it violates our core values. But that is something that can be overridden or undercut by business necessities or by other things. Here's another example. Employee expectations it may not just be a question of work-life balance, but expectations about what is involved in the employment relationship itself. There might be a very different model in the host country. And so the idea is, well, to the extent possible, adapt yourself to the host country. But of course, there may be aspects of it that violate universal norms. You're not going to adapt to widespread discrimination, for example, nor are you going to do things that really do compromise the company's mission. This too is gonna to have to be decided by context, case by case, the presumption will be in favor of adapting to the local, but you may not always be able to do that. Let's return to the question of the core values. What then really follows? If Locke is right that the core values are a right to life, liberty, and property, if there really is something like a law of nature that applies universally, independent of cultural norms and practices, that says no one shall harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions, then what exactly follows? First of all, the right to life. We can say legitimately, yes, companies should not kill people. They should not murder people. But more than that, they should not subject people to undue risks. Lots of jobs are risky, so the claim here isn't you shouldn't put people in any situation of risk at all. Mining is risky. Construction is risky. There are lots and lots of jobs that involve physical risk, as well as emotional and mental risk. And so the point isn't you must not allow anyone as an employee to risk his or her own life or own mental health or anything like that. Then we couldn't get much done. But the point is this. You shouldn't endanger people needlessly. You should respect rights to liberty. So you should not take advantage of systems of slavery or forced labor, even if they already exist in that country. You should try to reform those practices, and you certainly shouldn't try to benefit from them yourself. Taking part in that is something that helps it to survive and to thrive. That's something that's morally unacceptable. But it goes beyond that. You shouldn't employ child labor, even if child labor is commonplace in that country, for example. You should not exploit people. Now, the definition of exploitation is a complicated thing. It might simply involve coercion or deception. Maybe it goes beyond that, taking advantage of someone. But whatever you think it involves, and that's a complicated moral question I can't get into here, but that shouldn't be done either. People have a right to liberty, and that's a liberty not only not to be imprisoned, for example, or enslaved, but also not to be exploited in some way that takes advantage of their own lack of options. That's something that raises big moral issues. 
but it's plausible to say that a company should not exploit people taking advantage of their own lack of options. A core value is property, and so theft is wrong. C taking resources without adequate compensation is wrong. Are there any additional core values? Well, if we incorporate a Kantian idea, we could say, yes, equality is a kind of core value, at least equal treatment under the law, under the rules of the company. We could think about the formula of universal law, for example, in Kant. Act only on that maxim you can at the same time will as a universal law. That's something that tells us we have to apply universal laws. We have to apply the same rules to everyone. That means we can't discriminate. And so discrimination is something that looks wrong from this point of view. Now, it's a subtle question. Discrimination on the basis of what? Presumably, we think we can prefer talented employees to employees without talent, people who are hard workers to people who aren't. And so there are lots of things that are relevant to job performance, but there are other things that are at least presumptively irrelevant to performance. We should not discriminate on the basis of those kinds of things. Now here, the reason I mention the complexity of this is that in the United States, for historical reasons, we take certain classifications and set them aside as things that are suspect classifications. You may not discriminate on the basis of these without making a very powerful case in favor of doing that, without requiring that that is, in this highly unusual situation, a bona fide occupational qualification. Due to different histories in other countries, there may be different categories that you have to respect in this regard. So, in short, this question of discrimination is subtle, and the way you think about it in the United States may have to be expanded, may have to adapt to the situation of that host country. But that, too, is a good candidate for something that is a universal value. Respect for people as ends in themselves seems like a plausible value, and that will entail not only no deception, no coercion, no exploitation, it may well mean that within the employee-employer relationship, there is a certain core, basic level of respect that has to be accorded to employees. There are certain ways that people simply should not be treated, even if it doesn't kill them or recklessly endanger them, even if it doesn't enslave them, even if it is something that doesn't steal from them. It may be a level of disrespect that no one should be subject to. Those things, Donaldson implies, are really universal. And so start with those as core values. Respect life, respect liberty, respect property, respect a principle of equal treatment. Beyond that, adapt yourself to local customs, practices, and traditions to the extent that your corporate mission allows it. There may be cases where you have to actually avoid doing that, where you say something else takes precedence over adaptation to the local custom and practice. But the presumption should be in favor, he says, of adaptation. In short, you shouldn't fail to adapt, except for good reason. What are the acceptable reasons? That's something he doesn't answer, and I think it's a complicated question. We've mentioned the corporate mission as something that is important. Of course, the company may have values that go beyond those core values. You may say, look, I recognize this isn't a universally held value, but it's something we value. And we're not going to adapt in this way because we think it violates our core values as a company, even if it doesn't violate universal core values. So I think it's a complicated question. We can really just raise it here and make a couple of proposals along those lines. But the idea then is going to be this. We have to find a balance between adapting to the local practices and norms of the host country and maintaining the practices and norms that we've had all along and that we apply in our home country. How do we do that? The presumption is in favor of the core universal values. Those must not be compromised. Then, once those are respected, the presumption is in favor of adaptation. But we have to make the judgment case by case. There is going to be no universal rule we can apply for when that gets overridden or undercut, that presumption is something that may have to yield to the corporate mission, to corporate values, to other considerations. There is no rule for determining exactly which those are or how those balances are to be struck.